Nisha, thank you for being back with us. Uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, one of your newest uh, writing efforts and endeavors, but also I think a passion of yours that you've demonstrated uh, over the years, and that is mistletoe. What is mistletoe? (laughs) Okay. Well, most of you associate mistletoe with kissing under it at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so just one thing that I like to point out about that is when you think about this plant, first of all, it's a semi parasitic plant that grows out of sync compared to the rest of the plants in the animal and the plant in the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. So that right there should be a clue that there's something probably very interesting about the personality of this plant and it's it's uh like you know it's importance it's role that it could play in disease especially something like cancer which is so much about something that's out of balance and out of rhythm you yeah. know and out of sync with its organism with its host so um when you think about it the the first of all this plant has been around I mean, forever. We've co-evolved with it for thousands and thousands of years, and it's been written about in ancient texts and and even mythologies. I think Homer and a few others talked about how it was a sprig of mistletoe was given to somebody so they could go and visit their lost loved ones in the underworld, and it had this kind of connotation of resurrection. So I think that it's also interesting that it comes around you know, uh, birthdays of very important spiritual figures and, you know, holy days, if you will, of, of that time frame. The fact that it it fruits in the winter, mm-hmm. it's like nothing else does that. And so it's also yeah. got this very interesting, like, well, what is, there's got to be some good juju in those berries, you know, for that to be so rigorous to be able to do this in the winter months. And then the way it grows through the summer months, very, very slow and very, very intentional and it grows inward instead of outward. It doesn't reach up towards the sun. It goes inward. It never touches the ground. It stays on these tree, you know, on the the branches and it's left there to graft by the poop. Love it that a naturopath gets to have this part of the story, that a poop (laughs) is from a bird, a a particular thrush that eats the berries and, you know, leaves its excrement on um, the tree where it grafts in over time. Mm. It's just this, it's just a cool story. It's like a yeah. Dr. Seuss story or something. Yeah, that's fascinating. Right. Right. And so what, what this crazy guy, even though it's been used for thousands of years, it's been known to be great for epilepsy, for arthralgia. So pain patterns, it's been known for spleen tonics during Hippocrates times, which in modern times, that means things with the marrow, you know, mm. the immune system. So some clues there, but it was used as its whole plant extract. Um, it's a toxic plant. So we don't want people running out making a tea or something with it because it will kill you. It's very, very toxic, but as is true for many of our toxic herbs, those become great precursors to a lot of synthetic chemotherapies today. And so things like periwinkle, you know, the mint Christine and things like, uh, Pacific yew tree, which is taxatier or taxanes. So all of these plants that have like a lot of toxicity in nature also can bring us a lot of medicine. To standard of care today. Right. So mistletoe likely has some of that um, as well. But about a hundred years ago, a crazy philosopher by the name of Rudolf Steiner, a lot of people don't know him, but they know a lot of his work. So if you know anything about Waldorf school education, mm-hmm. if you know anything about permaculture, which is a particular type of, of agriculture, very much in accordance with nature and patterns in nature. And if you know anything about anthroposophical medicine, those were all ideologies that came from this philosopher, Rudolf Steiner at a time um, way back when. And he also was an incredible observer. And in that he started looking at trees and said, well, that, that crazy plant growing in that tree looks so much like a tumor, this concept of doctrine of signatures. Yeah. So it's like, when you look at a wall and you're like, oh, it kind of looks like a brain. Is that good for the brain? Why? Yeah. Yes, it is. You know, <laughs> he had that same kind of epiphany sure. and he basically brought into his midst a, a doctor by the name of Ita Wegman. And together they started basically experimenting in 2000 or excuse me, 1917 into the 19, early 1920s on patients to see if this did actually have efficacy with cancer. Lo and behold, first of all, how in the world they knew to take some extract of the berry and some extract of the, of the leaf and wow. basically chop them finely and centrifuge them with a particular dripping of water in a, in a sort of potentized, almost homeopathic way. Yeah. I want to know what he was on because yeah, clearly yeah, yeah. something. Where did that come from? <laughs> You're like, you know this. And then to know that, that it was to be injected, not, mm-hmm. ingested. not ingested. They started to inject it back in, in 1920. 
Mm -hmm. We just hit over our 100 year anniversary of this plant as a continuous treatment in cancer, as an injectable. Later on, it became used in IVs and intratumoral as well, but it's always been necessary to inject it because the lectins, the polysaccharides, the viscotoxins, which are the medicinal components of this uh, like manufactured extract, um, is what gives it its anti-cancer effect. Now, taking it in its tea form and stuff that you've read about in the past, yep. it has some other implications in medicine, but it's not the anti-cancer effect. Right. You have to avoid the GI tract because it's very volatile, even hitting air, um, even hitting your mouth anywhere along the tube, it will break down those important cancer fighting agents. So um, we know it needs to be injected. At least the research has shown us that to have efficacy as a mm -hmm. cancer agent. And so it's also the most studied integrative oncology treatment, this semi-parasitic plant that grows out of rhythm with nature. How cool is that? And it has always classically been used with standard of care. It's one of the few therapies that we can kind of put our stamp of approval on in the naturopathic or integrative oncology world to say that we feel confident that it's not going to interact negatively mm. or cause problems with your standard of care therapies. Yeah. So if you were diagnosed with cancer, say in Germany or Switzerland, you had 80, 85% of the time you're going to be given this treatment at some point during your standard of care treatment because it actually helps the bone marrow stay healthy through chemo. It helps mm -hmm. uh, offset the fatigue of chemotherapy and radiation. It helps the quality of life of giving people some calmness. We think it does so by probably upregulating endorphins and endocannabinoid system. Um, it definitely has some areas in its prevention and treatment of cachexia and metabolic disorders. It's got some hormonal stabilization. It's acting like a little bit of a natural aromatase inhibitor. It acts as a natural angio, anti-angiogenic. It lowers VEGF. It lowers interleukin-6. It um, upregulates natural killer cells and T-dendritic cells. And probably this sounds like a lot of Greek to you or your listeners, but basically those things I just articulated are what we're spending millions, if not billions of dollars on in research in standard of care oncology practices. And yet we've had a therapy now that's just over a hundred years old that has hundreds of really good studies and thousands yeah. of studies in general from all over the world. Yeah. It's been used as part of the, of the, as the repertoire in healthcare systems in North America, outside of the United States, um, South America, Europe, and India, it's part of their like pharmacopoeia. So it's it's considered, you know, a, a, a tool, a medicine, and it's been known even on Sloan Kettering's website, it talks about this as a cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, you know, a lot of times we have to be very careful about saying, oh, this treats cancer. Right. This is actually a therapy we can say that about. We actually have the data to back it up. And we actually just completed the first uh, clinical trial on an IV treatment of solid tumors in the, um, after patients have, quote unquote, been failed by, I say been failed by, not they failed, um, standard of care, uh, where they were basically coming to the point of hospice eligible and not taking any other therapies. And just from that single safety study, they're moving into phase two and on to phase three, which is good news in the yeah. U.S. that this may be the door way in to finally making it more, I mean, it's been used here all along, but this may be the let's drive her in on the train celebrating it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so for anybody listening to this yeah. who says, I have never heard of this, hmm. why do you think that is? Why do you think it is not a topic that someone with cancer wouldn't yeah. just naturally have a conversation about day one? Well, what, what you'll find is the intro chapter to the book. Actually, I'll hold this up really quick because so I know you don't have your copy yet because it's just hot sure. out of the glass. So this Perfect. is the book. Oh, there we go. Mistletoe there and the go. Emerging Future of Integrative Oncology, co-authored by um, seven of us from hematological oncologists to nature. We will link below to it. Thank you. Yeah. And so this was not just like a naturopath writing this. You've got hematology oncologists and MDs and anthroposophical doctors and naturopaths. All of us with experience, I mean, collectively, we have hundreds of years of experience with this plant between us. Um, it's loaded with the resources and research. And what's interesting is even the opening um, sort of forward or endorsement of this book was written by Dr. Luis Diaz, who was the uh, original uh, chief investigator on the Hopkins trial before he left Hopkins to join Sloan Kettering. He's now head of solid tumor oncology at Sloan Kettering, smart fella. Um, and he, was, he even told, you know, told all of us that, uh, this therapy will never make it into here because frankly, it's not a moneymaker, you know, and that sounds, I mean, it's, you're looking at a therapy that you could not patent. 
because it's a natural substance. You're looking at a therapy that depending on the person, the situation costs somewhere between 100 to 300 US dollars a month, which in the realm of integrative oncology is very inexpensive yep, yep. compared to some, I mean, most supplements are more than that. Um, and then you're looking at when you're looking at when it's now in competition or perceived as being in competition with a lot of our modern immune uh, immune therapies that can run upwards of hundred thousand dollars a month. Yep. Not, not a year, yep. a month for some of these therapies. And so this is where it's just going, it's just not ever going to be a big winner. So what we're hoping to do is like the book, by the way, is it's nonprofit. So it's not going to the, none of the authors are getting paid for this. We wrote this as a labor of love to be a steward cool. of medicine. Yeah. yeah. And to also help whatever resources come back that goes back into research. Mm -hmm. Because even the trial at Hopkins was not paid for by NIH or another, you know, research. This was philanthropically, you know, the donations came in. All of us, we supported this clinical trial. Um, and so we hope to have this be a book that helps offer more of that. Um, yeah. We're supposed to start, we were supposed to do a, a study thanks to COVID. We were going to do one on GBM and mistletoe, uh, one on breast cancer uh, and fatigue with mistletoe, and one where we were doing direct boluses of mistletoe into the portal vein for folks with hepatic, uh, hepatocarcinomas. Mm. So these were all like poised in the lineup to start here in the United yeah. States, but COVID kind of put a lot of people's studies on hold. We'll hopefully come back to those. And our hospital, we talked about in a previous yeah. discussion, will be a hub where we're doing a lot of this research. Um, so that is very exciting, you know, for us as well, but it is something that is utilized. If one of my dear friends, Dr. Ricardo Gelman is a pediatric oncologist, head of the biggest hospital in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and mm. they use mistletoe in the hospital for their pediatric oncology patients oh, cool. right alongside their chemo, yeah. right? So yeah. If you're comfortable to use this in the pediatric population, there's literal to no concern of right. the adult population, right? And then if you go to places like India, it's part of the medical system. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, no one has to pay for this. It's part of their medical system. If you um, are, if you are in Europe, you can go into a pharmacy and order it. You know, you can get it over the counter basically. And so it's just incredible how available it is in other places. And you have to step out of the borders of our, of um, the United States to learn that it's actually pretty well known and understood mm -hmm. in most other places. If you, Live in Europe you're about 60 to 80 percent of the time, depending on which country um, you'll be seeing or utilizing mistletoe at some point in your cancer journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah very, very interesting. So, <laughs> if someone um, is interested in pursuing mistletoe, yeah. um, I, I think I've heard of a couple different paths that, that yes. people take, either with their their primary kind yeah. of oncologist. Sometimes yeah. that oncologist yeah. is is pro mistletoe. Totally. Sometimes totally. they go a, a, a naturopath route. And then maybe a third path that um, seems to be out there is trying to get it themselves right. and and, um, and do yeah. their own kind of injections, yeah. things like that. What, yeah. what would you recommend for someone who's interested Perfect. in this? Perfect. Well, ideally, I would love to get every oncologist in the United States trained in this. And I'm part yeah. of a group. Hallelujah. Yeah, thank you, right? Like, <laughs> wouldn't that be just great? Yeah. Like, yeah. Sure it is. Right. And, and actually part of the book by doing this is we actually wrote it as sort of the best practices for physicians. Mm -hmm. And even though it's um, re like we had beta readers that were not patient, you know, that were lay people, um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a couple chapters here kind of juicy, especially like the immunology chapter and the research chapter. But for the most part, it's very readable by even yeah. the lay person. Um, but we wanted to just pretty much go, here's the book, Doc, I want you to read this and I want you to order it for me. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. and that's yeah, our yeah. goal is this becomes the new calling card for doing just that. Cool. Um, that's the primary. The second thing is because we're the same people who wrote this book, we're also the key faculty in helping train practitioners across the country um, and the world because there's there are practitioners across the world that need to learn it as well. Um, but ultimately, we offer now online training. So if folks can't show up in person. There's that. So you can actually learn it mm -hmm. and get certified and know what to do with it, whether you're an oncologist, whether you're a naturopath, whether you're a PA, a nurse practitioner an acupuncturist with um, prescription rights. I mean, really any licensed healthcare provider that has the ability to prescribe can utilize this therapy and can learn it online. We offer uh, uh, beginners as well as an intermediate and an advanced training. We also will be offering more and more in-person trainings as time allows. And in hopefully latter 2022 or early 2023, we'll be taking a group of physicians to Europe, to the hospitals where they get to see patients having intratumoral injections and intraperitoneal yeah. and intrapleural and to actually see how much more it's being done 
beyond uh, what we even do here in the United States. Again, when yeah. the hospital opens, we'll be doing all of those things under our research IRB. But but until then, we have places to send folks. So it cool. really is accessible. To your point then, you know, there are great websites. So believebig.org is the organization that raised the funds to fund the clinical trial at Hopkins. Hallelujah. These guys yeah. did an amazing job and now they're raising they're, funds. They're, they're, yeah, they're an incredible organization. An incredible organization. And the beautiful thing is they also, in their fundraising, they also raise monies to make sure that the doctors are mentored well through this to know because we're getting more and more patients demanding it and less and less doctors to know how to manage it. There's yeah. only a handful of us in the United States who are really seasoned enough to guide people through it. So I'm actually one of the mentors for physicians to teach them Got how it. to do this. Mm-hmm. So they're getting funds to help, you know, uh, physicians offset the cost of that training. They also help bring in funding for patients to help them pay for their mistletoe. So those that are having problems. So they're always raising funds to get money to help patients with that too. Then the MTIH group, um, we've talked about the Metabolic Training Institute of Health. We also have a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit organization, but we also are bringing in funds to help patients pay for integrative health care. And they can use it towards seeing the doctor or buying the mistletoe or whatever yeah. is desired. So there's another tool that's coming forth. And we hope that both these organizations continue their efforts and cross-pollination support of one another to keep building up the funds to help patients pay for much needed care. This should not be just in the hands of the, of the haves and avoidance of the have, have nots. So there's that. And then the final piece that you mentioned was patients like accessing it on their own. Mm-hmm. This is not a protocol. It very much depends on some very medical specific yeah. knowings and yeah. it can backfire. This is a therapy that is otherwise when it is applied correctly, it's virtually harmless. Mm-hmm. When it's applied incorrectly, best case scenario, it will do nothing. Mm-hmm. Worst case scenario it could actually cause harm. And so I understand people's desperation to treat and seek yeah. care for themselves, but it can backfire pretty terribly. One of the first times that Rachel uh, did uh, mistletoe, she had this reaction and, and we kind of realized the doctor that we were doing it with maybe didn't have the, so much the skills. Yeah. experience or skills or kind of working from other yeah. people's work. And, um, and it was supposedly a, a really low dose even for mistletoe is already pretty low what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but she she got these hives up her back and um, yeah. spiked Ooh. fever, which I know is is maybe a goal, but yeah. overly spiked fever. Overly right? spiked, but this rash yeah. was really kind of bizarre. Wow. And it, it for a long time scared us away from mistletoe. Of course. We just kind of said, we're just going to, nope, we're going to walk away from this one. And and we're just now really coming back to oh, good. to that conversation and going, okay, all right, we can calm yeah. down a little bit. I know yes. that was scary, and maybe she has an allergy. Maybe you know, maybe she's an anomaly. But I have a feeling right. that if we right. had the the right doctor in in a exactly. medical environment to help yes. us through that, that yes. we can reintroduce yes. that. Hundred percent, and that's exactly like having telling that story to whomever is helping you prescribe it is going to be key because yeah. they'll likely put her on even a different host tree or a different yeah. form just to make sure because you yeah. want because especially I mean you know I know your listeners know you know Rachel's diagnosis but colorectal cancer is probably one of the most well treated well served yep. cancer type to this treatment and so I'm always even if I have a patient have a end up with the wrong person or the wrong host tree or the wrong approach at one point, I try my darndest to help them come back to it. And I've, I've yeah. been very successful in finding another inroad in, because I think it's such a powerful one to help her maintain all the yeah. hard work she's done. And, and so I'm glad to hear that you guys are considering bringing it back. We're, we're definitely yeah. diving back in now, now that we're out of the last year of, of more of that active acute treatment and going, okay, maintenance. What, yep. What yep. Are we exactly. Clean up Coming maintenance a little it. bit. Exactly. Yep. And that's where, you know, the book, what I love about it, and I'll just really quick go through just the chapters. So there's yeah, three, please. Or, it's a uh, three, four parts. The first one is the landscape of mistletoe therapy. So a little bit of its history, the immunology science, the state of current mistletoe research. So it just gives you that kind of like, especially for the physician who's new to this and like, I need to understand 
Then it goes into mistletoe and clinical practice. And this is understanding of the host trees and choosing the yeah. right one to match the patient, not a protocol. And then the test assess address. This is my, my chapter, which goes into how to adjust your treatments and the priorities and response to your patient's terrain. So really guiding the clinician to say, don't just put somebody on this and have them go, and go to town. You have to be watching them closely. Yeah. And, yeah. And then part <laughs> three, just the human centered aspect of this. So the physiology of warmth, like what is it that we're trying to achieve with this? What is the importance of having a fever and not suppressing a fever? These are really, they're also really apropos for the times we're in right now. So it's really yeah. a beautiful chapter. Dr. Blandy does a beautiful job. And then there's this whole thing about sort of the anthroposophical constitutional care, human, um, how they see the human experience. Very cool for you to understand the philosophy behind this. And then some of the other anthroposophical medicines that are used along with mistletoe is in another chapter. And then this building of the bridge between mistletoe and other integrative therapies. So that's when I dive into where it does come into play with other conventional therapies into IV vitamin C, ketogenic diet, fasting, hyperthermia, hyperbaric oxygen, where it plays really well, off-label drugs, where it plays well with others. And then page chapter four is all about just weaving it all together and these sort of special considerations. So unique scenarios, we, we touch into the tissue, like the tumor um, injections and some of the specific cancer types, because a lot of people are taught to think that, oh, you can't use this in um, like uh, non-solid tumors, you can't use this in leukemias right. and lymphomas and whatnot. Right. And we're like, actually, let's dispel that myth here. Let's explain why. Um, and then we even talk about it and its use and utility in end of life care and how it can be such a beautiful help to transition someone in absolute grace and beauty. Um, and then also just like what is on the horizon for mistletoe. And this is where we're talking about the future of research, yeah. the future of healthcare centers, like what we're building. And then it's loaded with appendices on kind of the basics of mistletoe administration. The, um, the so that's method. where it's that resource for a doctor. Hand in the book. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all right here as well as where do you learn more? Where do you get your cheaper, um, where do you get access to good quality mistletoe? The cheaper yep. stuff. So it becomes an incredible resource for both patient and provider. And we're very yeah. proud that it's become kind of our textbook. So when we facilitate our trainings in the future, this will be our new, have you read the book? you know, yep, yep. when they come in, because it's nice to dive right into the clinical piece for physicians. They, they can read about the background, right? But to come in and say, how can you on Monday morning walk in and start helping people? That's what we yep. want them to have. That's yeah. the hands-on. It is, absolutely. And the patient then having a tool that helps them understand the why and helps them understand mm -hmm. why is it important that you get a little fever or a little redness or a little irritation? Yep. And what does it mean if you get a Rachel experience when it's too much? Right. It's, we talk about all that in there. So yep. yeah, we, we really found powerful. so much that it's, it's so important to understand why we're doing what we're doing, yes. whatever it might be, because yes. first it connects you to your journey, right? Yes. It goes, I, I'm connected to my healing journey. Yeah. I'm, I'm visualizing it. It's in my brain that when I take this, whether it's a supplement or chemo, yeah. I, I know what it's doing and I understand it. But also at 2 AM when <laughs> you're feeling weird and you go, I can't reach my doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Am I going to the ER? Yeah. What, is this expected? Should should I feel this way? When does it? Yeah. All of a sudden, that stress lowers when you go. Totally. I know what to expect. I know when yes. something is abnormal, when something is yeah. dangerous, when something is a concern, and I know when something is. This is just going to happen, and and Love here's it. what you can do about it. That that's oh, so yes. important for the two a.m. Yes. panic, and we've yes. been through many of those two a.m. <laughs> panics. Uh, and yeah. when we're able to connect and go. Okay, they said this could happen. Yeah. They said when that happens, we can do these things. Yes. Here's how we approach that. And it's kept us out of the emergency mode. Right. And, to just and the overzealous the game over management. Plan. Yes. Yep. Oh, my word. You know, and something else you said that I think is just really important to rehash is about the engagement of self. Like when you are in control, when you're the person giving yourself this injection mm -hmm. and you have the understanding of its history and of its relevance and the fact that we're now spending billions of dollars basically on this therapy, <laughs> you know, with a, with drugs that are far more dangerous to work with, yep. you start to feel pretty darn excited that you literally have something in your hands that is incredibly well researched, incredibly well documented, incredibly well tolerated and received, and yep. it puts you in the driver's seat all over again. You yep. then are changing the outcomes, and you're even improving. You're using it to even improve the other therapies that you're taking concurrently. It's yeah. amazing. That's so important. Huge. Yeah. 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 Yep. Cool. Yeah, the the mind body cool. connection is something we might not understand, but we can't deny. 
Exactly. Well, and it's how I think and how I feel affects my physiology. 100%. Well, it's so funny because one of my favorite things that happens with patients is they're like, well, how long do I have to be on this? I'm like, well, ideally, I'd like you to be on it for two years, you know, for up to two years after you're done with your treatment. So like for Rachel, I would say for two years. And then we we determine, and you start to spread it out. You're not doing it three times a week for that entire two years, typically, but you start to spread it further. I, I, I literally can probably count on one hand a patient saying, can I, you know, that, that didn't want to just keep going with it Yeah, <laughs> because they felt the difference if they took like a two or three week break to go on a vacation and they left their, you know, injections mm-hmm. home. Like I feel a quantifiable, qualifiable difference in my psyche and my quality of life and my overall mindset. So there are plenty of studies showing its impact on quality of life. So folks start to become, it becomes their friend. It becomes an ally for them. Yep. And it becomes another tool that makes them feel like, cause you know, a lot of people, they get to the top of Mount Everest after their treatment is done, they ring that bell, you know, and then they're like, see ya. And then they sort of stumble like the most, day, we, we die. I love, um, you know, Dr. Uh, um, oh my goodness, can't believe father of integrative oncology. Why am I forgetting his name right now? <laughs> oh, it's gonna drive me crazy. But his book, Life Over Cancer. I knew yep. it kind of, the book came to my brain, but he talks about how the real danger starts when they start to come down the hill after the treatment. And I yeah. feel like this is that tool. This is your Sherpa to get you safely down the other side of the summit, because it's when you're left your own device up there and you're like, okay, well, at least I was doing something every week or every couple of weeks. At least someone was monitoring me. At least someone was there. People get really uneasy when they're left alone after the treatment is done. And I think this is another very powerful tool, whether it's placebo or real, is offering them something that says, I am still engaging, and I'm now using this to clean up from my treatments and to help fortify my system even more to be more resilient to help prevent recurrence. So amazing, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, very cool. Uh, well, thank you for, for sharing about awesome. mistletoe, uh, but also about this new and exciting book that's coming out. We, we talked about my copies in the mail, so yes. it, got, it got delayed from Amazon, but <laughs> it is on its way and I'm excited to, Rachel and I are both excited to dive into it. Um, and you've convinced us we're definitely getting back on the wagon, yes. getting back on the mistletoe Good. train. Uh, it's been on the list. And I mean, as you know, as someone going through cancer there's a lot on the list there's you a go, lot on the list yep. yes. you go, all right what am i prioritizing today it might be eating i'm gonna prioritize right. eating <laughs> right right 100%. but we're, we're coming out of the fog and uh, that's definitely something we're putting on the train awesome well i'm happy to help so give me a call right. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good right. all right thanks nasha you're so welcome thank you